Over the years, I've gotten a bunch of messages asking how I do my fan films, especially because I'm a one-man show, uh, one-man productions, and I do everything myself. I do all the parts, I do all the editing, I do all the effects. So a lot of people have asked me how I do that. So I thought I would make just a short documentary about how I go about uh, making my fan films, and hopefully it will encourage some other people to make their own fan films. Any fan film has to start with a script. Um, it, it's important to have a good story. If your acting isn't very good and your effects aren't all that great, uh, people will forgive all that as long as you tell a good story. So it's worth putting a lot of effort into a script so that you get a good, interesting story that people are going to want to watch. So where do I get my story ideas from? Everywhere. Uh, the last fan film I did, which was uh, Predator vs. Stormtroopers 2, the idea for that came from an old movie with Val Kilmer and Michael Douglas called The Ghost in the Darkness, uh, which was about uh, man-eating lions in Africa. Uh, and even though that story was about uh, 19th century Africa and my story was about a futuristic space hunter, at their core they were both really about the same thing, which is the effect that colonialism has on people. So that's where that story idea came from. This third idea for the film I'm working on now is Predator vs. Viking. Uh, that came when I was on vacation in Norway and I was walking through a reconstructed Viking village uh, and saw the Stave Church and I thought to myself, wow, that would be a great background for a movie. So in an instant the storyline ran right through my head and I could just see the whole movie laid out. So for the next hour or so I just ran around shooting background shots uh, that I would need for all that and, and brought them back with me. So that's where that story idea came from. When I first sit down to write a script, the only thing I think about is getting a good story. At that point, I don't think about what costumes I'm going to need or what props or how I'm going to do each scene. I worry about that later. But after the script is set and the story is all finished, then I have to start looking at everything in practical terms because I have a micro budget. So I need to look at every scene and decide how am I going to do this? Is this even doable? And if I have to change things, uh, what is it I need to change and what do I need to change it to? So that process all starts after I finish the story. A lot of times I'll have a scene in the script that's important to the storyline, but it's really, really hard for me to film, especially by myself. One example of that is in my movie Dark Times Ambush, where there's a fight scene between a Jedi character and Darth Vader. Now for other filmmakers, that would have been a simple choreographed fight scene. But for me, it was a real challenge because I play both characters, and I have to film them one at a time, and I need to make sure that all the lightsaber moves match so the blades would hit each other like they're supposed to. So what I had to do was plan out a series of sword moves and figure out each individual stroke and block, and then film myself as each character doing uh, that, each side of that move and then composite them together. So in the end, it really looks like there's two characters swinging swords at each other, but what was really happening was that it was just me in front of an empty green screen swinging at thin air, um, and it worked out in the end pretty well. Sometimes after I finish a script, I change the characters just to make it a better story. An example of that is my fan film Predator is the Hunt. That was originally written as a story about a squad of stormtroopers, but to make a better story, I changed that into a series of characters from a whole bunch of different sci-fi films so it would be more interesting visually and it also emphasized the fact that the Predators were hunting creatures from all over the galaxy. Once I have the script finished and the characters set, I have to start making all the things that I'm going to need to bring those characters to life. Now most of my fan films are, uh, contain established sci-fi characters and they already have their particular costumes and their props. So my task there is to match all of those as closely as I can. So I've already done video tutorials on how I've made costumes and props from Star Wars, Predator, Star Trek, and Aliens. Sometimes I need a particular prop for the story that I don't already have, and then I have to scrounge one up. Uh, there's no way to teach people how to do that. It's sort of an art. You either have to have an eye for it or, or you don't. Um, so I'm pretty good at scrounging stuff up like that. Uh, for the movie uh, Predator vs. Stormtrooper, I needed a pair of electro binoculars, and I got these when I happened to be walking through a store and saw a detergent bottle sitting on the shelf, and it was the perfect shape for what I needed, so I took it home, fixed it up, glued all kinds of doodads on it, 
and that's what I used in the movie. In Predators the Hunt, the mobile infantry character has the armor that he does because I happened to be online on Amazon one day and saw some BMX uh, bicycle armor that looked really, really good. Uh, so I got that. Uh, a couple of months later, Steven Spielberg used the same armor in his TV show Terra Nova, but I had it first. When I did the insectoid characters in Predator vs. Stormtroopers 2, I picked that look deliberately uh, be because of the story. Because the Imperials were treating the native inhabitants like bugs and were just squashing them without even thinking about it, I wanted that to be reflected visually and that's why I picked the costuming that I did. So because I play all the characters in my movies myself, I have to pick the costuming so that there's only one that has a visible face. All the other ones have a mask or a helmet. Uh, so the only face you can see is on one character, and that way nobody knows that I'm the one playing all the characters. So sometimes my face is the main character, uh, and sometimes it's a minor character, and the main character has a costume, mask, or a helmet. When I first started making YouTube movies years ago, I was using a uh, cheap little 640 by 480 camera. The sound was awful and the picture was fuzzy. What I use now is a mid-level high definition camera. It has an internal hard drive uh, and it stores uh, footage in AVI format. And then I can use a USB cord to import the footage from the camera into my computer so that I can do my editing. Over the years, I've played around with a lot of lighting systems. The first thing I did was just use sunlight coming in through a window, but that meant I could only shoot for a couple hours every day. Now I use what the pros call three-point lighting. Uh, there's a lot of tutorials on the uh, net about that, so I won't go into a whole lot of detail. But basically the way it works is that you have one light off to one front side of you, and that's called the key light. And then there's a slightly dimmer light to the front of you on the other side. That's called the fill light, and that fills in the shadows that come from the other light. And the third light is behind you, and that lights uh, the back and makes you stand out from the background a little bit, and that's called the backlight. So I tried to make my lighting system from stuff that I could find as cheap as possible that was easy to find. Now, some people use halogen work lamps that you can find at a Lowe's or a Home Depot. They give really, really bright, good light. Uh, but they're really, really expensive and they use a lot of electricity. A lot of times they'll blow the fuse out on your house. So those are a little bit risky to use. What I use instead are compact fluorescent lights. Uh, these don't get hot. They don't use a whole lot of electricity, so you can run a whole bunch of them uh, and it won't blow your fuse. And uh, they give pretty good light. Now they come in two varieties. There's one variety that's built for inside use uh, and that gives kind of a yellowish light to it, so that doesn't work very well. The, the, the ones I use are daylight bulbs. Those are balanced to look like natural sunlight, and they give pretty good lighting, so that's what I use. One thing that I could not scrounge up was a good stand to attach the lighting to, so I had to buy a couple of uh, lighting stands online. These stands are good because they're adjustable, so I can move them up or down, and they have a nice wide base at the bottom so they don't fall over. All of my movies are shot in front of a green screen, and that's just a big piece of green cloth that I have tacked up on my living room wall. And that lets me sh uh, shoot myself uh, as each character in front of this and then composite everything together. In the computer, I can take out all the green, make that all transparent, so I can put in whatever background I want. I can put in as many characters as I want in one shot and composite them all together. So that's basically how I make the films. Now there are a lot of tutorials on the web about how to do green screening, so I'm not going to go into a whole lot of that, but the most important part is that you have to have good lighting, and that means you have to have separate lighting on your green screen than the three-point lighting that you have on yourself. So to do that, I have two different light stands, and while I'm filming, these are about two feet in front of the green screen and both aimed backwards towards it because you don't want a whole lot of light reflecting from off the green screen onto you. That causes a lot of problems. So when you look through your camera, you should see no shadows, no folds, just a plain block of pure green. One thing you need to keep in mind when you're filming in front of a green screen is that you can't have any green color in your costumes or your props. Because if you do, when you key out the green background, that part of your prop or costume is going to disappear too and there will be a transparent hole uh, through it. You don't want that to happen. 
I had that problem when I made uh, Predator vs. Stormtroopers 2 because I had Rebel Trooper characters and in the movies their costumes were green and brown. I couldn't use any green because the keying process would have removed all of that. So I had to make all my Rebel Trooper costumes in shades of brown instead. Another big problem that you run into with a green screen is called spill. That's what happens when the light reflects off of the green screen and back onto you and it makes especially the edges of your outline turn like a greenish color and a lot of times then when you key the green out it messes up the edges on your character because those will start keying out too. So the best way to prevent that is to stand as far away from the green screen as you can and still be in camera. You want to be at least three or four feet away from the green screen and it really really helps if you have a backlight too because that lights up your outline and takes away a lot of that green color. Because I shoot my movies all by myself, storyboards are very important to me. On a normal shoot, all the actors are together on stage and the, camera, the director can just look through the camera and see who's facing which way and make sure everybody's moving the right direction. But because I shoot all my, by myself, I can't do that. While I'm doing my roles, there's nobody else there. So I have to talk to characters that aren't there. I have to move in front of characters that aren't there. So I have to know which way I need to face and which directions I need to move and I do that with storyboards. Storyboards are like a graphic version of the script. Uh, it breaks down the entire movie scene by scene and shows exactly where each character is going to be standing, which direction they're going to be moving in, and which line they're going to speak during each scene. And I do that with just three by five note cards that I draw little stick figures on and it shows where everybody is on the frame, which direction they're facing in, what lines people will be speaking, and which direction they want to be moving in. So here's how I film myself. Uh, because I don't have a cameraman, I have to have the camera on a tripod, and I set it at eye level so that I get a natural perspective. I uh, flip the view screen so it faces forward, that way I can see what I'm filming and make sure that I'm in camera and framed where I'm supposed to be. And for each character, I'll do the entire movie scene by scene, one at a time in sequence, and I'll just, uh, in the beginning, I'll hit the record button and just let it run and record the entire character all the way through from beginning to end. Because a lot of my costumes take a, such a long time to put on, I try to do all the scenes I need for each character all at once. So I'll just turn the camera on, do each scene in the movie in sequence, one after the other, and then uh, shut the camera off when I'm done. So in between, I move the camera when I need to. If I need a close-up, I'll move the camera forward. If I need a long shot, I'll move the camera back until I get all the scenes that I need. So once I've gone through all the characters in the movie and gotten every scene that I need for each one, then it's time to import everything to the computer and start editing. So the first step in the editing process is to take the footage from each character and import it into my editing software, and I use Adobe Premiere. And what I'll do is go through the entire file from beginning to end and break it down scene by scene. Now when I shot each scene, I did four or five different takes. So the first thing I want to do while I'm editing is to look at each take and then pick the best one and cut and delete all the others. Now for every scene I want to keep, I'll delete everything in the character's file before that and then cut everything after that and leave just the short little scene that I want to keep. And then I save that as a separate file and I name it according to the scene number from the storyboard and the character. So if it's the second stormtrooper in scene 23, I'll label the file scene 23 underline stormtrooper 2. Then I save each sequence in WMV format and convert everything to 720p resolution because that's the resolution YouTube uses. Then once I've saved the scene I want, I'll paste back the rest of the file and delete the scene that I just finished and then go on to the next scene. And I do that for each and every scene in the movie that the character is in until I'm done, and then it's on to the next character. Once I've done all the character footage, I end up with a list of green screen sequences that all have the different characters grouped together according to what scenes they're in. So now it's time to composite all the green screens, put all the characters together, and assemble the actual scene for the movie. 
So now I'm working in Adobe After Effects, and what I'm going to do is import all the sequences I need for each uh, of the characters in a particular scene, plus whatever background I need for that scene. Then by using the color key function in After Effects, I can remove the green background and add the background that I want, and then move each character to the place I want them to be on the screen. And then from here I can add effects if I need them, or change the size of characters if I have to, or flip them to face the other way, or whatever else I need to do in order to get the scene I need from the storyboard. Once everything is set the way I want it, I save the scene by the scene number that's on the storyboard. And that's how I make all the parts of the movie, one scene at a time. Once I have all the scenes composited, then I assemble the rough cut, and I do that by importing all the scenes into Adobe Premiere from the opening titles all the way to the ending credits, and assemble them in order, one at a time. Once I have the rough cut assembled with all the scenes in order, then I go through it a couple of times just to trim scenes that are a little too long, or take out pauses that aren't supposed to be there, and kind of set the pacing of the movie. And then once I'm done with all that, it's time to add the soundtrack. I don't use any of the audio that actually got recorded while I was filming the characters. Camcorders have omnidirectional microphones, which means that they not only pick up the sounds that I'm saying to the camera, but they pick up every other sound in the area, and they try to make every sound sound just as loud as every other sound. So it not only picks up me and what I'm saying, but it picks up air conditioners in the house, and it picks up cars driving by outside, or airplanes flying overhead. So most of that uh, audio is just not usable. So when I import to the footage to start editing, the first thing I do is delete the audio track. So all of the dialogue that you hear in the movie is actually recorded later after the rough cut is assembled. Now because I do everything myself, I have to do something to give each character a different voice. And I do that in a couple of different ways. In Predator vs. Stormtrooper, I posted the lines that I needed to one of the costume forums that I'm a member of and asked people there to record themselves speaking those lines and then sending the audio to me as a WMV file. And I just edited that, trimmed it where I needed it to fit, and dropped it in the soundtrack. Now that process worked for that movie because all I needed were short lines and exclamations, but for the other movies, I needed more extensive dialogue and I wanted more control over the pacing and the inflections, so I had to do something myself. So in the movie Dark Times Convoy Raid, I voiced the dialogue from my own character, and then I used computer-generated text-to-voice software to do all the other voices. For Predators the Hunt, I voiced all the characters myself, but I used audio editing software to change my voice for all the other characters. To record the dialogue that I need, I use a little netbook computer and a microphone. And what I'll do is run the movie on the netbook. I'll run the rough cut. And uh, for each character, I'll go through the entire movie from beginning to end and voice the lines that I need as they come up on screen and then save it all as an uh, audio file and import it to the computer so I can edit. The next step is to load each character's dialogue file into a sound editor. I use Audacity and adjust the pitch or the frequency to make my voice sound like a different voice that matches the character. So for something like a Klingon or for Darth Vader, I need a deep, low-pitched voice. And for something like an insectoid character, I want a high-pitched, whiny, squeaky voice. Once all the character dialogue's ready, I load all the files into Adobe Premiere, put each character's dialogue into a separate soundtrack, and adjust the sound levels until, they're all, until they all match, and then I go through the entire movie from start to finish, uh, picking the best take for each bit of dialogue, then trim it to fit and drop it where it needs to be in the movie's timeline. Once all the dialogue is recorded and placed in the timeline where it needs to be, then it's time to save all that and start working on the sound effects. Now just like the dialogue, none of the sound effects you hear in the movie were actually recorded during filming. They're all added later in post-production. Now for iconic movies like Predator and Star Wars, they have sounds that everybody recognizes and you can find them all over the internet. So it's not very hard to find the sound effect that you need and put it into the movie timeline where you want it to go. 
sometimes I need sound effects that uh, I can't find a, a, a file for and I have to make it myself. In Predator's <laughs> Hunt, the screeching cry made by the trackers was an audio combination of a dolphin and a bird. And the horn that calls the trackers back, that was made by me blowing over an empty beer bottle. So once I have all the sound effects I'm going to need, I load them all into Adobe Premiere, open up a new audio track, and start putting each sound effect where it needs to be in the movie's timeline. The final step in the movie is to make the music track. Uh, for movies like Predator or Star Wars, the, the music is uh, already available on the internet so you can download them as MP3s or as WAV files and put uh, p bits and sections of the theme music into the places where you need it to be in the movie. One thing you want to make sure you do is to match the sound of the background music to what's happening on screen. So if you have a dialogue screen where there's just people talking to each other, you want the background music to be low and, and kind of uh, sitting in the background. But for big action scenes, then you want really loud, active uh, background music. So you want to make sure that the music and the action both match each other. And once the music is done, it's time to upload to YouTube. So now that you know how I make my fan films, it's time for you all to start making your own. You don't need a big budget or a big crew or a whole lot of money. All you need is some creativity and imagination. So get out there and make some movies.